So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Perry, and I'll apologize up front. I'm a little under the weather today, um, so I'm on a lot of DayQuil right now. Um, <laughs> so if the presentation's terrible, it's either because I'm on drugs or TJ's awful. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you're not off to a good start, sir. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so uh, a little bit about myself before we start talking about encryption and um, looking for evil in encrypted things. Um, I'm a technical account manager at Gigamon. Um, our office is just a couple blocks away. I actually work remotely. Um, I live in Vermont, but I come out here quite regularly. Uh, stuff about me, um, I'll throw out there. Um, the first line there, I've got fuzzy vaults, and you're probably like, what the heck is a fuzzy vault? Um, when I was doing my master's in comp sci, that's what I did my thesis work on, was actually a, a fuzzy vault is how one method of storing uh, fingerprints, like if you, you swipe something on like an Android or an iPhone or something like that. So my thesis work was on breaking a, a popular fuzzy vault, which was especially fun because the guy that was doing the research from Michigan State was a real jerk about sharing his, his data, so that was rewarding. Um, Next line, basically, uh, I would just say I'm, I'm a nerd, like I'm into crypto, it's one of my favorite things. I do security um, for a living, but I'm a crypto enthusiast, and saying that is not a good way to make friends or pick up girls. Um, what else have I done? I worked at the GE CERT for a while. Um, actually, one of my first experiences with, with Bro, back in 2010, I, I wrote some stuff to parse the Bro logs and uh, try and do some detection around that. So. That was cool. Uh, formerly a federal agent at DHS, specialized in computer forensics, but um, at DHS you were a, an agent first before that other stuff. So uh, thank you for all feigning shock that the husky bald man with the goatee was a fed. No. <laughs> uh, currently, uh, I call myself a, a hero generally on the team. I think I'm compensating for the credit that my boss doesn't give me. <laughs> Uh, but what I like about what I do now is I get to help customers, um, and that's, I think, really impor important for people like, like TJ and I. We're not salespeople, so if we have a problem that we can work with someone on, and um, even if our solution isn't the right one, um, we're happy to do that. And the other thing I like about my job is I get to sort of dabble in lots of things. So I'll turn it over to the, uh, the peanut butter to my jelly. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're off to a good start, sir. <laughs> we are. Hey, uh, I'm TJ Beely, uh, also a technical account manager at Gigamon, working with customers. Um, background is in comp sci, did some parallel computing research in college, um, moved into IR consulting and got my fill very quickly there. These days I'm mostly hunting across network data in our solution, uh, Zeek based of course, so up to my neck in Zeek data. Um, writing code and stuff like that, um, pretty much just helping customers operationalize. So. You good? I'm good. All right. See, TJ's a millennial, so usually he has to find a way to make everything about him. This is <laughs> the part in the show where he would like me to give him a trophy for something. Uh, so, okay, uh, what we're going to talk about today, basically, everything's encrypted. If you work with network data, you know that. Or mostly everything's encrypted, or it's headed that way. Um, so, as someone in security, what can we do about that? Um, we're going to talk about metadata quite a bit today, and give you some use cases and examples. All right, so why stranger things uh, when we're talking about encryption? There's a couple of reasons. The first one is uh, we think the analogy is pretty good as far as uh, in stranger things, there is oftentimes evil lurking right below the surface where you couldn't really see it. So that kind of played well. Um, the other thing was when you think about metadata and stranger things, um, it was often the case where you could spot signals of what evil might look for, and then you could sort of zero in on, on what to find. So we just thought it, it sort of dovetailed nicely um, with talking about encryption today. And beyond that, um, our boss, uh, Justin Kohler, who sadly couldn't be here today, uh, <laughs> he's a very excitable fellow, and, and he gets really excited. He was like a professional rollerblader or something in the 90s. I don't know. So that's, that says all you need to know about him and why he was really excited about Stranger Things. So we did this for him, mostly. Yep. We, uh, <laughs> we had a picture of Justin. If you watch our talk uh, from B-Sides Augusta, you can see this, but we had a picture of Justin here where we sort of decorated him as a cat, um, but he made us cut it from this version, so. All right, so uh, as you all know, mostly everything is encrypted nowadays, and you don't have to take my word for it, so um, I'll look at this handy graph. So what we have here, this is just a percentage of uh, page loads over HTTPS and Chrome by platform. 
okay? And you can look back sort of the last five years, but basically there's significant growth um, in terms of encrypted traffic that we were seeing. One thing that I'm sort of curious about here, um, I don't know if anyone here knows the answer to, but it's, it's curious to me that the green line on the bottom, um, which is on Linux, that seems to be trending a little bit lower than the other platforms. Don't know why that is, just thought it was interesting. But certainly overall, you can see um, that as we go, encryption um, becomes more and more pervasive. So yay privacy, right? Um, I don't know, there's, there's pros and cons to it. I'm actually a, a big proponent of privacy. I, I think it's um, really important. Um, but the downside with privacy is that it also allows other avenues for attackers, right? So you can get uh, malicious payloads downloaded. Um, if we're encrypted, it's harder to detect. Uh, C2 channels nowadays are often encrypted. And then, like, if you've ever seen something like a, a 1.jpg that's an encrypted RAR, like our, our Excel is being encrypted, has been for years now. Um, and all of that serves to obfuscate what's going on and make it uh, difficult for um, security analysts. So basically, that leaves us in a position where as there's more and more encryption, what we currently have in place is not working as well. So our, our Suricata and Snort rules of the past are no longer as effective. Uh, <laughs> this slide is like, basically TJ's like, come on, Patrick, we've got to throw in a slide where we pander to the CISPs. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I'm just gonna make some loose connections here between uh, CIA stuff and, uh, uh, and encryption. So you sort of have the sea of confidentiality with uh, Encryption, encrypted traffic will protect from prying eyes. I, in integrity of the data, data is ensure, uh, you can ensure that data is not changed. The AU there is not the accessibility A that I think of with uh, CISP, it's, this is for authentication. With encrypted traffic, we can verify that Bob is actually Bob. And then, of course, non-repudiation. You can prove it was actually Alice that did something. And then you're gonna have some drawbacks to encrypted traffic as well. Uh, like I just mentioned, you might not see a malware payload. Um, you might not see exfil. And this is just weak, TJ. Like, I, come on, man. <laughs> Availability, don't lose your keys. Like, come on. <laughs> it makes sense. Come uh, on. I guess. We're really stretching on that one, but okay. <laughs> um, so as security practitioners, what are we going to do about this? Well, we could decrypt all the things, right? Um, there are pros to this all of the, our old stuff starts to work again, right? So all of our old Circata, Snort rules, um, security measures we have in place will once again work again um, if we're able to decrypt all the things. And if we're able to sort of look at everything, obviously that gives us more data points to analyze, so that can be more robust and interesting. But there's uh, negatives to decrypting all the things as well. One is potential loss of user privacy. So we could have a separate talk about, you know, should Patrick be doing his uh, banking on the company network, right? But as a user, um, you know, it's just something that people do and something that uh, you want to remain uh, protected. So if you start decrypting all the things, you have to think about the privacy implications of that. Um, if you've ever done certificate management before, um, it just, it, it's not that it can be, but in my experience, it always is a giant pain. Um, and when you break things, um, implementing decryption, you break things badly, typically, has been my experience. So the other side of that coin is we could do some metadata-based analysis. And this is where Zeke comes in is super useful. Um, some positives to this approach is that uh, SLS or TLS metadata is not encrypted, right? So if we can find interesting things there to look at, then that's available to us for detection or hunting or even security posture. Uh, if we're just looking at metadata, then obviously that's gonna be a, a smaller subset of data than looking at um, full content. So it means less, uh, less storage money, greater capacity kind of thing. And then um, I, I'm not a huge uh, user of NetFlow myself, but it is still a thing and you can still use it to hunt with, but it is difficult. Uh, drawbacks to this metadata-based analysis is it certainly requires infrastructure to be able to parse out all this stuff. This is where you might have like a security onion, you might have a product like ours, Gigamon Insight. There's lots of different products, they're all outside there. Um, and you can use any of them to, to get 
some of this to varying degrees of success. Uh, storage costs can still be really high with modern networks because there's just so much data. Even the metadata, there's so much of it. And finally, um, if you run a SOC or a security program, you know that anytime you have a, a new or different approach to how you're analyzing, you have to train people on how to do that. And that can certainly be costly and timely, uh, time consuming. Okay, so which one would we recommend? Well, in a perfect world, we would do both. Um, you get the benefits of everything, uh, things don't cost anything, this is like unicorns and rainbows, right? It's great. Um, but in reality, that's, that's not really um, how things are for most people and most orgs out there. So we recognize that you can decrypt. We're gonna talk to you today about focusing on the metadata. Um, and you know, there are challenges there. We concede that there are absolutely sometimes values to um, decrypting all the things, but we wanna, we wanna look at the other side of that and seeing what can we see with just the metadata today. All right, well, I'll turn it over to my, <laughs> my good friend. <laughs> Watch it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about specifically getting into details of what, what metadata can we actually look at and what does it do for us. Uh, these are the fields that uh, bro can parse out. I'm probably stubbornly gonna keep saying bro just out of habit, I'm sorry, I'll do my best. Um, so let's go through these one by one here. Um, important thing to note, the TLS version 1.3 is coming and it's gonna take away some of the fields that we currently use from an SSL or TLS uh, session or event. So we'll uh, talk about that as it's applicable, and when TLS 1.3 is gonna steal away one of our fields here, we'll display the scary monster in the background. It's the impending doom. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk in the abstract. I actually have data that I'm uh, using or to back up most of my assertions here. Uh, now, the data we used for this research was uh, roughly 100 billion TLS sessions uh, coming from about 50 organizations. Um, covering all industries, but primarily coming from healthcare, tech, and retail. And this was about two months worth of traffic. So um, the fields we're gonna go through, uh, the data that I'm gonna be displaying is from this set. So let's start off with something nice and easy, kind of ease into things, uh, the version string. So this is just the specific version of SSL or TLS that's being used to establish the session. Uh, the way this works is that the client will suggest uh, one or more versions that they support, and the server will pick the one that, you know, wants, that it wants to use. Um, no one should be using SSL v2 or v3. They've been deprecated for a very long time now, um, but we'll take a look at later and see if anyone's still using it. Uh, so what can we do with this field? Uh, we're gonna break things down into three use cases, uh, security posture issues, detection, and hunting. Uh, the version string is mostly a can be used in posture uh, use cases. Uh, really, we're just looking forward, you know, do we have servers that are still supporting this and we should you know, update them and, and or disable this functionality? There's really not a, dis a detection or hunting use case here because, again, all roads are gonna lead back to posture. If you detect that you have a server supporting SSLv2, you're just gonna go clean it up. So there's not really like a detection or hunting use case that we would think of in the traditional sense in, in a SOC. Uh, and this is what the data looks like. It's very simple. It's just TLS V and then the number the, indicating the version. Um, so let's look at the data now. Uh, over those 100 billion some odd TLS events, uh, we saw seven unique versions. Uh, and this table is going to summarize uh, what we saw. Uh, main thing to take away here is that uh, pretty much everyone, everyone's using TLS, some version of it. Uh, I mean, over 99.9% you know, .9 of the sessions were some version of TLS. We did still see some SSL v2 and, and v3, um, but no TLS 1.3 quite yet. Uh, one thing that stood out to me when I started writing this talk a few months ago, uh, DTLS, I did not know it, that that existed or what it was. That's TLS for UDP, for those in the room that don't recognize that, so who knew? Uh, so moving on, uh, kind of come back to the version string here. Uh, again, it's mostly a posture issue. We, I mean, it, you could write a detection saying, hey, show me you know, SSL v2 or v3, but you're probably not gonna find it as we saw from the numbers before, it's not very common. And even if you did, it's more likely to be a vendor that you need to go yell at as opposed to some old obscure archaic malware in your network that's using that. So, uh, and also TLS 1.3 is not gonna come into play here because the version string is used to establish the SSL tunnel, uh, so it can't be inside of it. Just had to come interrupt, huh? 
That's great. <laughs> uh, so moving on to the Cypher suite, uh, similar to the version string, uh, basically this is going to determine uh, you know, how we're setting up this tunnel, what are the actual mechanics we're using. Uh, and similar to the, the version string, the client's going to suggest what it wants to use or what it can use, and then the server will pick the one to actually you know, use. Uh, and then here the connection will fail if the host can't agree on a Cypher suite. So uh, what can you do with it? Uh, this uh, mostly, there's certainly a posture use case, that's for sure. Uh, you can look for, again, deprecated Cypher suites, old Cypher suites, things that shouldn't be used. Um, there could be a detection and a hunting use case here, and we'll see what I mean by could be on the next slide. Uh, and then this is what the data will look like in Zeek. Uh, it looks like a long obscure, obscure string, but really it's just listing out the different components uh, that you're using. So in this case on the top row, it'd be TLS, elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, RSA, AES, 128-bit, right? So not, not too bad once you know what you're looking at here. Moving into the numbers, um, so over those 100 billion uh, sessions, we saw 226 unique ciphers. Uh, this table is going to summarize what we saw. So the, what I, the way I decided to present this data was of those 226 ciphers, I split them up into five groups based on how many unique domains I saw using that cipher. Um, so for example, in the top row here, uh, there were only 27 ciphers of that giant set uh, that were mapping to over you know, 1,000 unique domains in a seven-day period. Right, uh, and that number could go higher up into tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, but the point there is a very small uh, set of the totally unique ciphers we saw were responsible for uh, an overwhelming majority of the unique domains and sessions that we saw. Now, conversely, at the bottom of the table, uh, two-thirds of those unique ciphers mapped to 10 or fewer unique domains and a very tiny portion of the sessions, right? Uh, and we can break that down even further. Um, almost half of the ciphers only map to one domain and an even tinier portion uh, of the sessions here. So there's a really giant long tail, right? A very small set of the cipher suites are mapping to an overwhelming majority uh, of all the TLS traffic that we're seeing. So uh, that's why I say, uh, you know, there's, there could be a detection slash hunting use case here. It just depends. Um, if there's a piece of malware in your network that, and that's the thing you're trying to find and it's using one of those 27 very, very common ciphers, it's not gonna work as a detection after you find it because you're gonna be drowning in false positives. And uh, it's also not gonna work from a hunting perspective because it's just too much data to dig through. You can't just pick out the bad thing in 100,000 unique domains, right? And uh, so it's really gonna depend. If the malware is using one of those other more obscure uh, cipher suites down at the bottom, maybe those 102 that only map to a single domain, yeah, that, that'll work for detection and that'll work for hunting because it's a very, it's a much smaller data set. It's going to have way fewer false positives. So it's really going to depend here. Um, so it's hard to say will it or will it not be useful. Probably not, but who knows. TLS 1.3 is not going to affect us here either because again, we're using Cypher Suite to uh, establish the session, establish the tunnel so it can't be, in, so, you know, can't be contained within it. Next, uh, we're going to talk about JA3 hashes. Uh, what is that? Well, the JA3 hash is essentially just an MD5 hash, but MD5 of what? Well, when you go to establish a TLS session, the client is going to send a client hello packet with different parameters of how it wants to try and establish this session. And then the server is going to respond with a server hello packet that's going to say, here's how I could, you know, establish the con this connection. Uh, if you take out some of those, you know, values from the hello packet that is going to, you know, describe how this session is established, turn those values into a string of integers, essentially an MD5 hash that string, you have your JA3 hash. Now, um, the saying JA3 will map to the client, the client hello, and JA3S will map to the server, the server hello. Um, so what can we do with this? Uh, well, first we should probably cover, you know, what's the point of the JA3 hash? Essentially, it's to kind of give you an idea of what's the underlying application. Uh, different people write code differently, right? And your browser is going to use different libraries, different components to establish TLS sessions that maybe PowerShell would, right? So the J3 hash is meant to give us an understanding of, well, try to give us an understanding of, you know, what is causing this connection. So what can we do with this? Uh, not really a posture use case here, uh, because again, the fingerprint is trying to give us an insight into the application. So if you want to go find outdated applications, go look for outdated applications. Um, you could make the argument that there's, there's room here to find stuff, but it's, 
it's, it, it's a stretch. Uh, it's, it's not gonna be as easy to use. It's much better to be used for detection and hunting, and we'll cover why on the next slide. And this is what it looks like, an MD5 hash. It looks like you would expect. So let's talk numbers. Um, I'm gonna split up JA3 and JA3S because they are fundamentally different. One's the client, one's the server. For JA3, uh, we saw over 200,000 unique JA3 hashes. That's a lot, right? It's a really big number. Uh, but what we noted was a really small portion of the hashes uh, comprised a very large uh, number of the sessions. And that's what this chart is gonna try and uh, communicate. So what we have here along the x-axis is the, the top n unique hashes that we saw by session count, and on the y-axis, the percentage of sessions that they comprised. So, for example, uh, the top 10 hashes, the top 10 most common, uh, mapped to 36% 36, 36 of the t total TLS sessions that we saw. Uh, similarly, the top 50 hashes mapped to the top, or to 71% of the sessions, and the top 100 mapped to 83% of the sessions. So, this is what I mean by, you know, a very small uh, percentage of J3 hashes mapped to a very large percentage of sessions. Uh, now, why is this important? Well, the point of the J3 hash is to tell you roughly what is the, or attempt to tell you what's the underlying application. So, if you see a hash, you don't know what it is, you want to look it up and see what that is, right? Uh, well, you could basically, you know, throw in some intel work here on the top 100 uh, hashes, going and looking them up and seeing what is this, what is it tied to, and you would have an enrichment or some additional context on 83% of the TLS sessions coming out of your network. That's really helpful because uh, if you want to go look for weird stuff, uh, things you don't, you know, you haven't identified yet, uh, that's going to cut your, you know, your body of work down to 17% of the traffic, right? Because you're going to say, give me the hashes I don't recognize yet, just to go hunting. Um, and then also we can take our known hashes, let's say we, we know what the PowerShell hash is, and we can go look and see, is, do I have any hosts that are using PowerShell to establish some connection out to some low reputation VPS provider, right? So it's a more targeted guided hunt. So again, main, main takeaway here is that with a little bit of Intel work, you can get some, uh, a lot, a high volume of enrichment by you know, percentage of TLS sessions in your, in your uh, network. And there, this has implications for detection and hunting. Now, looking at, well, I guess real quick, I'll walk you through. So I actually went and did this, you know, a, a little quick Intel process on my own with this sample set. Um, so what I did was I took the top 100 hashes and I ran them through uh, just an open source JA3 database. I used JA3er.com. Um, and then what JA3er.com gave me was user agent strings uh, for the JA3 hashes, or at least the ones that it had a record of. Then I took those user agent strings, pumped those into a user agent string database, and that got me the application and version uh, of, the, you know, of the application that was tied to the JA3 hash. And I used useragentstring.com for that. So, uh, run through this process, uh, I got results for roughly half of those top 100 hashes. Uh, and it didn't take much time. I think this took me maybe 10 minutes of writing Python to just do a couple API requests and pull this data down. Uh, and then suddenly I you know, had uh, some enrichments to go work on. Uh, now, clearly, there's, you know, more Intel work to go do, right? This was 10 minutes, and I said you might spend a day doing this Intel work. But the point is, with not too much input, you can get a lot of output. So, uh, now moving on to JA3S hashes. Uh, here, we observed 424 unique hashes, so a much smaller number. Um, I broke the data down into a table similar to the Cypher suite. It might look familiar. Um, again, taking all the unique hashes I found and putting them into five buckets based on the number of unique domains that I saw for each uh, hash. Uh, now, uh, for those of uh, you who might notice, uh, the numbers here are very similar to the numbers for the Cypher suite. Um, I think that's probably because the JA3S hash is attempting to fingerprint the underlying application, and the underlying application is probably going to consistently pick the same Cypher suites. So I think that explains the, the correlation there. And it is pretty strong. Running through the numbers here, again, roughly two thirds of the JA3 hashes, uh, JA3S hashes map to less than 10 domains, or fewer than 10 domains, uh, and a tiny portion of sessions. Now it might look a little bit more familiar. Uh, and then again, roughly 40% here of the hashes tied to one domain or fewer. Uh, so, a very similar uh, data output uh, from the Cypher suite. And so unsurprisingly, when you ask what can I do with this in terms of posture, hunt, detect, similar breakdown to Cypher suite. Uh, maybe a posture issue, may, or maybe a posture use case here, looking for old software, Cypher suite might be easier to use. Uh, but, and then maybe a detection hunting use case here. It depends on 
does the malware using a really archaic server uh, to respond to its C2, or is it just using like straight out of the box Apache, right? Or Python simple HTTP server, something more common, right? So it really depends. So bringing it all back together to our original slide here, there, when you're talking about J3 and J3S, uh, there, is str there are strong use cases for hunting and detection, especially for J8.3, because there's just so many unique values that there could be, and then also there's a lot of context that we can tie in uh, on the application side. Uh, finally, TLS 1.3 here is not gonna come into play, because again, we're fingerprinting you know, the session establishment, um, so the session is not, so nothing here is encrypted. So, uh, moving on to server name indication, or the SNI. Uh, this is just uh, the domain. It's, it's how you specify which application, which host you wanna talk to uh, when you're going out to an IP address, because these days, right, we don't just host one website on one IP. That would be insane. Uh, so, this is how you specify what you wanna talk to. But at the end of the day, it's just a domain. So we can do all the things we used to do with domains, right, with hunting and detecting. Um, again, it's just a domain, there's nothing fancy here. So I don't have numbers for this, right, because there's no need to dig through numbers. There's lots of domains out there. Uh, they're all over the place, they can be anything. Um, so I don't really need to convince you of, you know, that domains can be useful. But what we do need to talk about is how TLS 1.3 is gonna come into play, because it could take this away from us, but it might not, depending on how you have things configured. So let's talk about what I mean there. Um, so backing up to, Pre previous versions of TLS, uh, the SNI was always optional, right? You don't have to specify uh, a domain. Uh, and if you go look through Zeek logs, uh, for the SSL logs specifically, you'll see that there are cases where the SNI field is blank, or the server name field is blank. Um, you can just go straight to an IP, but it's just much more common, especially in uh, just, you know, traditional consumer level products that this will be enabled and you'll be able to specify the domain. Um, so for TLS 1.3, we're gonna get the option to encrypt the SNI, uh, and that'll be accomplished via DNS, right? You do a DNS request essentially for a website's public key that would be used to encrypt it, and that's how you would encrypt it and send it along its way. Um, but uh, this is an optional setting because the SNI itself is optional, so you can't really require encryption of something that might not be there. Um, now, why would we do this? Well, it kind of gets back to privacy, uh, back to our yay privacy rights slide. Um, it does protect you know, who you're going to talk to. Uh, it prevents me from sitting in the coffee shop next to Patrick and sniffing his traffic and seeing, oh, he goes to Bank of America, let me try and crack his password at Bank of America, right? So it, it prevents people from targeting you, basically, and it also prevents your ISP from stalking you and trying to sell you things. So there, there's a, a privacy slant here that we're trying to protect. Um, and then similarly related to the SNI, we have certificate attributes, uh, right? Again, same kind of thing, like, what is the certificate attribute, but it, kind of boils down to a domain. There's other fields we can pull out of it, especially from the subject and issuer fields, um, but largely we're looking at uh, domains here is what it boils down to. Um, typically the server is required to you know, provide a certificate, but not always, and typically the client is not required to provide a certificate, but it could. Um, but anyway, so what are we looking to do with certificates? Well, same thing we do with, with the SNI, right, with domains, because we can pull that out, usually. Uh, we, can, we have all the, the typical detection and hunting scenarios we could have with any domain, but there also comes to be some, some posture moves as well, because we can look for, you know, self-signed certs within our network of people who aren't following, you know, uh, defined processes, or maybe self-signed certs out on the internet, that'd be kind of weird, uh, look for expired certs. There's just a lot of things we can do here uh, covering both IT and security use cases. Um, and this is typically, you know, what a certificate, uh, what what Zeke pulls out of a certificate will look like here. It's basically a comma separated list of uh, certificate attributes, right? Um, so there's a lot of useful stuff here, usually a domain, usually some other stuff we can look at, like you know, states and organization units, we can look for weird strings that don't really make sense. Uh, but naturally, of course, because certificate attributes are so useful, uh, TLS 1.3 is gonna come and take it away from us because it was too useful and we won't wanna make our lives easy. So let's talk about 1.3 a little bit. Um, why would we encrypt the certificates? Well, privacy, right? We wanna hide who you're talking to, uh, but also because if we didn't encrypt the certificate, but we did encrypt the SNI, we'd kinda be shooting ourselves in the foot because I could just see in the certificate that Patrick's going to Bank of America. So certificates will be encrypted. Uh, the SNI is optional, right? And it, just like encryption is optional, but the certificate will be included within the encrypted tunnel. So that's going away. 
uh, and that kind of sucks for analysts because it's one less, uh, sorry, one less data point uh, that we can use. Uh, but uh, we'll get through it. So uh, that's all the fields that we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna pass it back over to Patrick here and he's gonna get us started on some <coughs> use cases. All right, thanks TJ. So um, the way that TJ and I think about this is basically there's kind of three logical um, ways that we, we, uh, we consider this. There's detection, hunting, and posture. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, detection first. Uh, sort of as a disclaimer, um, so I spent a lot of time um, in my career in a, a SOC, and um, my own personal experience is that kind of your mileage may vary with open source Intel um, in terms of detection. Um, I find it's very useful sometimes for like decorating data, um, but I would say I've not had as much success relying on it necessarily for um, high fidelity detection, shall we say. Um, same thing is going to apply here if you have um, intel that is related to um, this metadata that we're talking about. You, know, you wanna find things that are um, unique if possible, you want high fidelity, you don't wanna kill your analysts in the SOC chasing things that are um, not terribly useful. Okay, so what I have here is, um, and you'll have to take my word on this, so this is a, a screenshot of our product, um, Gigamon Insight, and the reason that I show this is trust me when I say that TJ and I are probably the saltiest guys in this room. We have no <laughs> desire to sell you anything. More than even our saltiness though is we are lazy. And um, this was the easiest way for us to get the data to show you today. So. Um, what I'm wondering is, can anyone tell me what are we looking at here? Trickbot. Trickbot, who said that? Nice, yeah, if I had a prize, I'd give it to you. <laughs> but it's Trickbot, and how did you know that? 447. Exactly, 447. Um, so with this metadata um, that we're extracting, there's different opportunities for detection here. So obviously we have the destination IP, the desk port that was just mentioned, which is the giveaway for that this is actually a, a TLS session with TrickBot. Um, there might be um, things that are interesting with the, the common name uh, field within the subject. Uh, if you've not done this, what I would recommend is if you, the Security Onion conference talks from last week are now um, on YouTube. There was a talk the gentleman did um, where he was looking for evil um, in, in certificates, and in particular, he kind of focused on this field, and it was, it was pretty interesting. Um, what he was doing was basically a comparison of what he could see in this field versus like a DNS request or something and, and seeing how they matched up, because what he found was there were a lot of malicious things out there that would like randomize uh, the common name field, for instance, and it wouldn't actually have a valid uh, like top-level domain. So that might be uh, one place that you can focus on detection. Might be able to do similar things with the issuer. Uh, here we're just showing that um, in our product we're extracting or calculating, I guess, the, the JAW3 and the JAW3S hashes. Um, so you can use those for hunting. Um, uh, you know, lots of products do that now. And then finally we have the Cypher Suite, which is what uh, TJ had talked about earlier. So these are all things that are potentially useful um, for us in terms of crafting detections. I wanted to give you a couple examples. Uh, so I'll start with Green Cat. Does anyone remember Green Cat? Bueller? <laughs> okay, cool. So what you should be thinking right now is, damn, Patrick really is old. Um, Green Cat was like, I wanna say it's from the 2000s, um, but what was kinda neat about Green Cat, it was um, at least one of the first fully featured backdoors that I'm familiar with that was uh, it, it was a uh, web C2, but it was all over SSL. So back in the day, uh, the way I was trying to do detection for GreenCat was I would look for known user agents, specific URI patterns. The problem is, of course, that this requires decrypted HTTP proxy traffic, right? So um, if we're trying to leverage metadata, what I had done in the past was no longer super useful, right? So I use that as an example of uh, what not to do. Now, uh, these two are a little bit different. Mac truck, uh, you might be familiar with even if, if you're not fully aware of it because it sort of became popular a couple years ago, or at least notorious when it was leveraged by North Korea. Um, but Mac truck, same thing. Um, 
over SSL, but it provided actually a couple of uh, unique detection opportunities. It had a specific certificate subject and a spe specific issuer subject, and you could actually write a detection um, if you had a sample of that malware um, to, to get high fidelity detections for that. So that's using the malware um, and using the metadata um, of that specific malware for detection. And then Roadhouse, just as sort of, a, as I said, a, a crypto enthusiast, I threw in here because I think it was fun. Um, what was cool about Roadhouse was that while it was over SSL, it actually did um, uh, asymmetric uh, encryption, right? So what was happening with Roadhouse is that it would use, it had embedded within the malware like uh, an X509 uh, certificate, which you could actually use to detect a specific SHA-1 and specific serial. So you have to get creative sometimes, but these detection opportunities are out there. And when we start leveraging the metadata, that's closer to what we're looking for here. Okay, so this one is maybe more relevant to, uh, to most people now, but something that we're able to do with the metadata that, that's available today. So with PowerShell, um, something that we see a lot with uh, red teams and some uh, uh, just other malicious actors out there is <clears throat> if we have the, the, the JA3 for, for PowerShell, um, we can actually see PowerShell or detect that over SSL traffic, and when you couple that with something like looking at the, uh, the issuer, if it's uh, Let's Encrypt, for instance, with that JA3 for PowerShell, you can find some interesting things. Um, and that's really sort of the goal here, right, is we want to get more high-fidelity, relevant detections leveraging this metadata. Um, so that, for us, is, is an example of uh, you know, things, things working. And then finally, um, this is another thing I kind of threw in at the last minute because I thought it was fun. Um, but Reductor, does anyone know what Reductor is? Kaspersky blogged about it uh, a week ago today. And it, it's kind of terrifying, but also pretty cool. Uh, it's actually the successor of something called CompFun, um, which was a malware. But, uh, so there's a, a link if you want to read about it yourself. But why I think this is really interesting is because uh, it does something that's called uh, watermarking TLS handshake. So the way this malware works is um, basically an endpoint would have to be compromised, but once it's compromised, what it does is it subverts the, the pseudo random number generator in a browser, for instance, right? And what it does is when that, um, uh, when that uh, handshake happens for SSL, it actually, um, in the first like four bytes or something of the exchange, um, it, it builds in, it bakes into that handshake um, a unique ID. So an attacker on that network can sort of monitor everything very closely. Um, so you'd really have to have a pwned network for this to, to be um, fully implemented, I think. But just like thinking about what's going on there, it's like, wow, that's, uh, it's really cool, um, but terrifying. But at the same time, we do have a way that we can detect it, right? Because there is a unique SHA-1 fingerprint um, that is available um, that, that can be parsed out that, that you can find. So um, even the really scary stuff um, in the land of encrypted malware, we can still detect. TJ. Thank you, sir. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so Patrick talked about detection. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about hunting. So uh, whereas detection, we're trying to find the things we already know about. Uh, hunting, we're going looking for stuff we, we didn't know about. Uh, and typically, we, uh, we go looking for attackers, right? We only find the breach, the malware. Uh, but more often than not, we find nine uh, hygiene issues or security lapses that you know, don't really scare us, but it's like, you know, they should be fixed, right? Because that's how the attacker's gonna come in. Uh, but when you go looking for the attacker, um, there's, I like to break it up into like you know, describing it as, Either you're looking for you know, who are we interacting with or how are we interacting with them, right? Which, what, what's weird, right? Where can I find the weirdness and the who or the how? So if we take the fields that we've talked about so far and break them up like this, uh, this is what we get. Um, we see the SNI and the certificate attributes over on the who, right? Because those map to, let's just say domains for simplicity. Um, and we can kind of do what we've always done with domains, right? We can look at prevalence, right? How many hosts in my network are talking out to this domain? When was the first time we saw it? When was it registered? Who owns it? Are there any weird string characteristics, right, about the domain? Uh, but unfortunately, remember, TLS 1.3 is coming and it's gonna take away 
both of these probably, right? Maybe not the SNI, but we'll see. We'll see how many people end up uh, enabling that, that feature. Um, but we're still left with uh, the how side of the house, right? The Cypher Suite and the JA3 uh, hashes are meant to tell us the how, the underlying application. Um, now there's fewer questions we can ask here, right? We still ask prevalence, right? How many hosts in my network are using these things? Um, it, but more importantly, we can ask what software is running this under the hood, right? And, and that will still be here, and arguably that's a better way to go about looking at stuff, because we've been struggling with the who already for a while. Uh, especially with techniques like fast flux or just attackers adopting DevOps, right? You can spin down and up different infrastructure pretty quickly. So the who's already getting kind of hard, um, so I think the how is actually a, a, a nice uh, replacement, potentially. So let's go through uh, a hunt really quickly. I, I got five minutes left, so I'm gonna try to speed through this. What I'm looking for here is uh, new JA3 hashes, ones that I've never seen before. So my question in Gigamon Corporate's network was, um, Show me all the, all the JA3 hashes and group them by the hash and the earliest timestamp we saw that hash. Now, uh, here's just a screenshot of my top results. I ran this on July 10th, and I saw, I saw two hashes that first appeared the day before. That's weird. So I looked them up. Um, again, using that, that same Intel process I talked about earlier, I ran them through this as well. So I plugged the first hash into JA3.com, and I got some user agent strings that made me think probably Firefox version 60 on a Linux machine. But maybe not. It's easy to change one character, one you know, subtle character, and, and have something different. So I looked that up in a user agent string database, and sure enough, it's Firefox version 60 on a Linux. Uh, so probably fine. Not malware, right? Probably just uh, an engineer at the office who maybe just updated their browser, maybe got a new box. Who knows, right? Probably innocuous. Maybe worth looking up. Um, but the point is, it doesn't seem too, too terrifying. This hash, on the other hand, I found no record of. So that's interesting. I want to figure out what it is now. Uh, but I have nothing to go on here, so I have to pivot, right? So what I did was say, okay, well, let me get, look at all the records over the past 30 days uh, that had this hash, and let me group it by the ASN organization name. And this is what I got. Uh, nothing scary. In fact, it just looks like normal user traffic for the most part. Possibly just someone browsing from their workstation. Uh, maybe they recently updated their web browser, and that's why you know, we don't recognize the hash, because it was just recently updated and hasn't made its way into the public databases yet. But given the fact that these are all pretty normal ASNs to be talking to, and the volume seems pretty low over 30 days, I'm gonna say, okay, probably not malware, probably something innocuous. And that's it, that was my hunt, right? Keep it short and sweet. Um, so just to recap what we did, I, I was looking for new JA3 hashes, right, over the past 30 days. Now, granted, those hashes could have appeared 40 days ago, and that would have been outside of my data set, and, right, so that, the fact that I was only looking at 30 days probably could have skewed my results. Um, so a better way to do that was, would be to have a full-time Intel team that's tracking this over time. Um, that, that, that would be ideal, right? Because then you, if you see a new hash, it would be new because we haven't seen it in the past year. And that's much more, uh, has much higher confidence or much higher fidelity than I just haven't seen it in 30 days. Um, now new hashes will appear right, as software gets updated. Um, but if you're tracking this over time, it'll, it should be much more manageable. And if volume becomes a problem, right, you're just seeing too many hashes every day, maybe you can pull in other data points like prevalence to help prioritize. Um, and you can also do this with certificates and domains as well, right? But again, it's, it gets kind of difficult. Um, so that was our hunt. Uh, last use case, we'll do it really quickly, is just posture. Uh, we're looking, basically we wanted to see uh, in this example who's using uh, outdated versions of SSL in the Gigamon network. And so we looked this up, and we actually got two hits. Uh, one was an actual vendor we were using that I've blurred out as not to publicly shame. Uh, the bottom website is uh, a site that's actually used for uh, you know, uh, testing for uh, outdated versions of SSL and servers that support those versions. So that's actually, that site's doing what it's supposed to do, so good on them. Uh, but that vendor, I think, got a talking to. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up real quick here. Uh, the main takeaways are, first, encryption's not going anywhere obviously, uh, it's here to stay. So we gotta figure out how to handle that. Doing both decryption and metadata extraction is ideal, but uh, they both have their pros and cons operationally, and that costs money, and money's not exactly free. So you, if you're not doing either one, you might have to just pick one and go with it. Um, so we tried to make the case for metadata. Uh, mainly that there's plenty of analysis left to be done. Uh, you know, TLS 1.3 is coming, and it will take away some of these fields, take away the who, but that's gonna take time, and then even when that does happen, we can still look at identifying the how, which arguably is a stronger uh, analytic use case. Um, now, as a community, the security community, community is gonna need to put some intel work in on JA3 and build up our public databases to the point of, you know, like how we treat file hashes, for example. 
Uh, but once that reaches there, at that, that point, and we're able to look up most hashes and get results, um, it'll be a pretty strong uh, analytic in my opinion. And that's all we got. I agree with you, TJ. Thank you, Patrick. Money is not exactly free. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all we got.